Yo, 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 what is going on, COD Familia? It is your boy BN, aka Mr. Kingdom Builder, and today I got a hot one for you. I love, I absolutely love doing these types of videos where I get an opportunity to dive into the kingdom slash alliance management portion, right? The unsung hero, almost like the taboo topical field of kingdom builders that are somewhat of a, that have been lost in time. And I love covering these. So today we're going to talk about how to be a good, efficient alliance leader. And we're going to cover everything you need to know on how to be a leader. And before we do really start diving into everything, I want to preface this by saying the average player usually does not know everything that goes into being a leader. There is, I mean, leaders, officers, Anyone who does anything on an alliance or a kingdom management level, you are more or less unsung heroes, and it is a thankless job. And because of that, what I want to say is that if you are a part of an alliance and you feel that it's a pretty well-oiled machine or it they do a decent job, every once in a while, show your appreciation. Send your leaders, send your officers, the people that put the work in to try and give you a good daily experience, which is really what it's about. Give them a thank you. Give them a shout out. Give them some love. Throw some flowers their way. In addition, I really want this video to be a great educational piece that covers something that will inform you and will show you whether it's a player, if it's a current officer, a leader, a current leader, or someone who wants to be a leader, what goes into this role and why a video like this has to be as detailed and has to be as long as it may be. I don't know how long it's going to be, but again, just to make sure we cover everything. So number one, let's go ahead and jump right in. Number one is going to be time commitment. Time commitment for me is important. It doesn't mean that you have to necessarily put it. We're not talking 12, 14, 16 hours a day. Now, honestly, you might do that, but it doesn't mean you have to. It just means that there has to be a realistic expectation that when you're leading an alliance, Depending on how well-oiled of a machine you have created over a period of time, of course, the amount of time you might put into an alliance early on is probably going to be more than what it'll be after maybe you've been there for a month, two months, a couple months, and you've really had an opportunity to put an infrastructure and a system in place that is allowing for you to kind of have that smooth operations. But... There is a chance that for those of you who think you can be an alliance leader and you're just going to put in one, two, three, four hours a day, I mean, respectfully to that, I do laugh a little bit, not necessarily at anyone, but just at the idea. Maybe you can get to that point, especially, again, we're talking like if you're just starting out and you're trying to get into it, you may have to put, you're most likely going to have to put in more time than that, but you will eventually be able to get to a certain junction where you might be able to only put in a couple hours a day on and off throughout the day, but just understand that there is going to be a higher than average amount of time you may think you're going to put in that you will end up putting in, especially, and this is an important one, if you care about your alliance and you want to make sure that it is taken care of and things are being done well, right in your mind, in your eyes. Yeah. Number two, managing versus playing. There is a big difference here that I think really gets lost in translation. You are a manager first, player second. Anyone who tells you otherwise is kidding themselves. When you're in the alliance, you are customer support, you're tech support, you are a, uh, you're a therapist, you are a, a, a helper. You, I mean, again, you are you're, you're Mrs. Doubtfire. You are all in one. And that's kind of what you have to be. And so my recommendation to you is to familiarize yourself with all the aspects of what can go into leading an alliance. Is that you need to know everything. And that really leads into probably the third point. Is that number three really is you need to be a jack of all trades. You need to know how to do uh, flagging. You need to know how to recruit. You need to know how to do diplomacy. You need to know uh, how PvP works, even if it's just at a foundational level, right? Where you could be someone like a worn on field general or kind of a, an overhead, you know, more kind of theater of war strategist. These are things that you need to be able to do as a leader. You need to be able to do every part. So that way, 
you can either build a foundation in a system out that officers can then uh, extend and execute, or you have a more active role in doing one, two, or however many of those things, and then hopefully eventually delegating them out, whether it be early on or later. And again, we'll, we'll get to some of the officer parts here in a moment. Uh, number four is going to be alliance announcement boards. This to me is really important that, that alliances do not leave untouched. And I'm going to give you an example here because we are in game. So we're going to show you an alliance announcement board that I ended up uh, getting sent from, going to get a, give a shout out to my buddy Kaz here because we have like a little thing going on in our in our uh, project right now but this is something that and you can see it's a little off center here and i'll show you an example of how you just fix that you just go in here and you just hit tab 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 confirm i go back to overview and you can see okay you know we're getting closer so we'll do tab 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 <laughs> so funny when i just say tab back to overview oh man we're so close tab 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 confirm and it will just leave it it looks okay so this is important to do, and I'm going to show you an example of ours. Now, this is just a rough draft. It's not meant to be, and I'm, I'm going to make a separate video on this as well. But this is something where you can see, right, we have like a family name, we have an alliance name, we have things like goals, uh, you have a kingdom discord, an alliance discord, you have allies, family head, alliance leader, officers, this would be where they're inserting their discords, and then you have like goals, leveling tips, etc. Right, this is how you should be somewhat templating and somewhat formatting your alliance announcement boards. Now, you may or may not have the family head portion. You may or may not have a kingdom discord, especially if you're just one alliance. But these are things that you should have because it looks professional and it presents itself in a very clean way. And that is... Oh, that's something that impacts how your alliance is viewed and also how your level of organization is viewed as well. If you have a professional looking alliance announcement board, to me, that speaks, I don't want to say volumes, but it does speak to the degree and to the standard of how your alliance hopefully is operating to an extent because you've taken time and some TLC and you've really invested in this. So to me, I, I do value that. And I think that's something that every alliance should do. Now, let's talk about how do you actually code this darn thing. So as an example, you can see you can just as a standard HTML code, right? B is bold, color, the size, and that's it, right? And then you're just spacing to center. It's really that easy. And there's nothing super intense about this, right? There's no special characters or anything like that. This is, again, what I would consider to be very kind of understated, simple, elegant uh, announcement board, right? Now, you can get a little more fancy if you really want to. But you can see, again, same thing, right? Bold, color, brackets, okay, right? Then you're just doing some nice formatting here. I scroll down, same thing right? Sure, you can choose some different colors. But again, this is a very simple way of going about doing it. And I just wanted to show that off because I think having just a good quality alliance house and board is important. Uh, then we get to the next one, which is going to be recruiting for your alliance. So I think recruiting for an alliance is, again, another important area of being a leader and something that the alliance should be doing. My recommendation, if you're just, and again, I'm viewing this as you coming in as a solo alliance. So if you're just an alliance and you're looking to recruit for yourself, one of the things you should be doing is you should be having a template message. You should have some type of easy copy paste message where you go into Tamaris or World Chat and you type out so you can figure out what the max characters are. And then you have just some type of nice recruiting message, some type of slogan or something that speaks to your alliance and maybe a sentence on why they should join. Uh, and, you know, maybe something else nice that goes in there as well. And this is something that's important. And I'll give you an example. Like, cause here, I'll, just, I'll just draft something right now. So let's go, uh, what's my alliance name? MRBN, right? So I'll say, uh, we'll go, we'll do this. Join, oops, hang on, I want a little asterisk there. So we'll do join MRBN. Uh, uh, let me see, gem, uh, BNs now open to everyone. Yeah. We'll say we are... You could say we are free to play and pay to win friendly 
as we are looking to uh, let's say uh, we're we're looking to have fun looking to have fun uh, do uh, do uh, I guess you could say family events right looking to have fun conduct family uh, con uh, have fun conduct uh, alliance events something like that maybe <laughs> conduct alliance events and uh, and help everyone uh, and help everyone power up oh man we'll do it like this we'll say have fun and help everyone power up as fast as possible something like that bam right and I'm not going to send this, but you, you get you get the idea. Having some type of templated message that you can easy copy paste for world chat. Also, if you see players that are posting here in world chat that they're looking for alliance, right? And remember, this is this be your home kingdom. You could then again click this. You click message. You send them a DM as an example. Uh, another way to do this is maybe you look at the <coughs> excuse me, maybe look at the power rankings. And you'll just scroll through here and maybe you see, you know, maybe somewhere closer to like the bottom 200 when it's just starting out. Maybe you notice some of the top players here don't have any alliance tags, right? That's something that you might be able to reach out to players for. Again, be creative with how you go about recruiting. But having a nice templated message, knowing what you're going to say before you say it is important. And then making sure that you're following through on that. Remember, first impressions and presentation is important. Don't just draft a message and not have anything organized in your alliance. Uh, and we'll get to some of those things in a bit on how you can organize the alliance beforehand, but you should really be doing that. Again, establish a good foundation before you go out and you start recruiting people. The next one is placing your center fortress. Uh, when you're just starting out, I think placing I think center, for, uh, center fortress placement is really important. For all intents and purposes, right, I think the important part is uh, you have to factor a couple things. One, uh, are there any villages nearby? Two, are you looking for level one and or level two pass access? And then three, are you somewhat close enough to get access to maybe one or two of your level one, two, and three behemoths? So that way you can try and aim for a good placement. If I'm using this as an example for Darlin, right? And let's just say I want to try and get to one of these level one passes, but I also need to factor in everything that I just said. Well, if I'm looking here, I see there's two level one behemoths with the bears. I see there's three giants right? And there's not necessarily a thunder rock nearby, so I might not go necessarily that way, which actually now is somewhat shocking because I, I honestly thought Darlin... Oh, man, it's probably because I'm in... Nah, never mind. We'll, we'll go here. <laughs> I'll show you guys this one. So uh, we'll use Nivola as a better example. Again, Darlin was okay for the area, but just so we can show you more of the behemoths. So let's go here to the west side of Nivola. In this case, let's say I want to get this level one pass and I want a level two pass, right? So I just have both available to me. Somewhere placing my alliance, I would argue somewhere maybe around here between this village and then this level one uh, giant bear behemoth could be an okay position. I would even be okay maybe even going somewhere here. Like you see how there's two villages right there. Drop my CF right here in between. Easy connect for those for the villages, which are going to give me additional buffs and resources uh, for everyone in the alliance. And then I'm also near a giant bear. I go up the ramp for the giant, and then I go over here up the ramp for the thunder rock, and I go across the bridge right here for the hydra, right? This is a prime location, I would argue. Those are the types of positions you really want to look for. Um, and flagging, and we'll, again, talk about this in a bit, but really factoring in all of those things, again, especially the villages. Uh, now let's talk about flagging and positioning, which is a good, which is a good, again, segue here. So if I'm going and I'm trying to flag out, the number one piece of advice I'm going to give you, especially for those that might be coming from Rock or other games, is that treat villages kind of like your gold nodes, right? You basically want to flag along village paths, while you are going to objectives, i.e. behemoths and passes. And that's really one of the most important parts. The second most important part is just remembering the closer you get to a river, the higher the mana income will be. Uh, now, let me see on this new alliance if I'm going to be able to actually flag something. Uh, because I probably don't have anything, but I'm going to see if I can at least click it. 
So let's see here. Let's go towers. Ooh, I might be able to. Oh, dope sauce. We can. Okay, cool. So let me give you this example here. So you can see, as, as an example, look here at the top. You'll see plus 20 an hour, plus 20, right? If I move this, left, right up, you can see how the numbers are changing, right? This is important. So let's say as an example, here's, here's some territory right here, right? So you obviously want to, and this is the thing, you don't want to overlap. You always want to be right at the perimeter, right? You want to always edge it just like this, how you see it, because that way you're building your flag at maximum distance, right, from another flag or another piece of territory, if it's a CF or Alliance Fortress. So again, remembering that's something you always want to aim for, uh, with the exception of, again, you can't necessarily see that it's connecting, and I'll probably give, let me see if I can give you a different example here. Where's my, here we go. Yeah, so this is kind of how it is. So you can see how like it's covering here. This is, again, just to give you another example. That's how you want it to look. Now, let's go. Let me see where I can find a... Okay, cool. So let's see if this will work. So you notice we're maybe only getting 10, 20 of mana over in that area. Let's go here. So now look what happens. This number jumps up to 80. So a nice little trick that some people may not know is that when you do build closer to rivers, you will get more mana, right? And you can see the difference here. How I'm at, what is it, 20? But the moment I start, territory starts overlapping a little bit more, right? Now I'm getting a bit more. I go up, now I'm getting 80. That's probably the most you can get, at least in this area. But you'll notice that's an important thing. In addition, you can see, right, some of the other numbers have increased as well, but the mana definitely has. Now, the uh, again, like I talked about before, where we did flagging positioning, cool. Yeah, so I think we're good there. Next one is going to be markers and where to place. So remember that you can place markers on the map. My recommendation for markers is placing them on behemoths, whatever you're going to go. Like, again, if you defeat a behemoth, and let me see if I could find one. Like, uh, hang on. Here we go. So defeating behemoth acolytes can drop these things. Mana stones, that will give you different. This is very similar to defeating guardians in rock at holy sites where again you'll go and defeat them they give you they give you a big boost of uh xp in this case it's prestige uh some arcane dust and some xp as well arcane dust is xp for artifacts and exp is artifact for heroes but then you also get some of the uh again runes and i believe it's runes in rock but here mana stones so b putting timers on here for when they spawn uh, or even for which order you're going to go in. Like, let's say you guys want to go hit up all of the behemoth acolytes at a bunch of different behemoth layers, right? You could do one, two, three, and then you attach times. Like, you'd say, hey, we're going to do this at 10. We'll do this one at 1020 or 1030. We'll do this at 11 UTC, right? Something like that. Um, those are ways that you can utilize your markers in an efficient way. Also putting markers on your RSS pits or your resource pits. An example of that when you end up building it would look like this. So if I go to, ooh, I gotta think, I gotta switch territory here. Yeah. Uh, so the ARCs, Alliance Resource Centers, whenever you place those. Uh, okay. Now let's move over to what else do I have on here? Um, Alliance Tech Path. So let's talk that. So if we go to tech, uh, let me first and foremost state that to me, I always think the most important thing in an alliance is increasing member capacity as soon and as fast as possible. So really, I think the very first thing you have to go for is you want to try and max out Divine Covenant. So doing whatever you need to do at a bare minimum to get to max out Divine Covenant 3 should be the thing that you do the, the, the at the earliest opportunity. Why? Because the faster that you increase member capacity the more overall tech donations that you're getting. Why? Because more people are joining, which means more average tech donations are being done, which means that you're going to be able to speed up all future tech once you have maxed out your member capacity, at least from Alliance tech development. Again, notwithstanding or not withholding for capturing multiple other behemoth layers to increase member capacity. And then, of course, you know, flagging uh, whatever it is, I think every 10 or so. So this is something that I really believe we should be focusing on. Now, after you end up doing this, you got a couple areas here, right? You got territory, you got behemoths, uh, and again, we'll we'll talk about a few. So in here you have uh, where is my next one? So gathering, right? So again, focusing on things that are going to help everyone speed up. To me, 
again, it's kind of a no-brainer. I think Development Tree is really the place to be. So after you do Divine Covenant, you're probably going to want to go back and do things like increasing your gathering speed. Uh, where's my thing here, right? So here you go. Like, here's all your gathering speeds. More expansion, um, production. This is actually okay. However, again, I'm, I'm again, next would be uh, gather speed. Then if we go into territory, let's see if they have something for me. I think this is just all mana. Yeah, it's just all RSS. Uh, battle tech is battle. However, there's some good things here. Hero EXP bonus. I think this is the next one you really should be doing, right? So trying to increase uh, or improve war tactics. Um, peacekeeping damage. You can't go wrong with that. Um, let's see if Clarion is what I think. It's not. Those are just additionals. PvP within territory. Attack territory. General attack. This actually isn't bad. PvP march speed in territory. That kind of helps you get to fights a little bit faster. And yeah, no. So really, war tactics and then peacekeeping damage would probably be the next ones you'd want to do after working on those primary ones in development tech. And then... When we get to territory, or sorry, not territory, let's just briefly talk about behemoth tech for a sec. So they've changed behemoth tech. You actually used to be able to upgrade specific behemoths that they had here. Now they've changed it to kind of just a universal stat thing here in behemoths. So after you do the cooldown, right, doing some of these stats, you know, I think are okay. Whether you kind of go HP, attack, defense, or if you want to go attack, HP, defense, really up to you. I think either of those are fine. Uh, you'll see here territory right damage taken by behemoths in territory, damage dealt to behemoths in strongholds, uh, and then damage dealt, uh, there should be one, let me see, behemoth attack, yeah, here you go, summon cooldown. So trying to max out morale rekindle I think is good, so you can increase being able to just do it, or excuse me, to summon the behemoth a lot more. And then again, going in that kind of HP attack defense or attack HP defense route, I think would be the next one that you'd want to do. Kind of following something similar with, you know, what you might consider uh, investing stat-wise in heroes. All right, now that's uh, we got the tech down, let's move to identifying and promoting officers and roles. So with officers, pretty simple here. I think the easy way to look at it is you want to monitor players as they're talking in alliance chat and just look for people that are helpful. Look for people that, one, are helping others uh, in alliance chat, but also are giving out good, consistent information. And when you, and that's a very simple and easy way to identify how you might look to find officers. Once you figure that out, you then message them and ask them, hey, do you have any interest in being an officer? Uh, maybe they do, maybe they don't. Maybe you also tell them a little bit about the role and what your expectations are. And then this is probably my big point on when it comes to officers. Always let them know that it's a probation period. Not only for them, but for you as well. Because when you, when you position it this way, it makes it easier so you're not committing hard to anything and they don't feel like they have to commit hard to anything, right? Where it's, oh, you're in, you know, it's like once you're in Fight Club, you're always in Fight Club. No, right? Again, always do it as though it's a probation thing where you want them to try, try it out and you also want to try them out. That way it's amicable if things work out or if they don't work out. <clears throat> Next, when it comes to roles. Now, I have somewhat mixed feelings on roles, so I'm just going to present it to you a couple a couple ways. Option one, you can just define a role for everyone. Say, hey, you're going to be the war officer. You're going to be the territory officer. You're going to be the recruiting officer. You're going to be the uh, uh, diplomacy officer, etc. And then you just define that role for everyone. The other way to do it is where everyone does everything. So every officer is privy and is up to date on how every role should be done, meaning that every officer can step in and assist anytime another officer is offline, which really, when you're doing it the first way, you would typically want to have a backup. So again, that would kind of be your second way of doing it. A third way, if I could try to think of one, would be maybe the leader does things as a backup, even though I feel like that kind of goes without saying. So I'm going to stick to these two for now. However, if you maybe have a different way that you've done yours, you know, please let me know in the comments down below, uh, especially for other people that are able to come in and, and read up on those. And I may even pin something or, or add something depending. Then we get to number, or sorry, I guess my next one. Uh, which is going to be, what do I have here? Tech and power auditing for player activity. Uh, this one I think is really important to do. Now, again, depending on when you watch this video, they have mentioned that they're going to add some type of update that monitors kind of when a player was last online. We just don't know what all the details are going to be until they announce it. So if something like that currently exists, hooray, by the time you watch this video or by the time you are. However, 
depending on the capabilities of it, I still think it's important to always do power and tech audits. The reason why is because if a player is truly active on average, you can establish a baseline for how many tech donations they should be able to do per a 24 hour period, how much power on average, depending on where their power threshold is, right? Are they kind of between one and 2 million? Are they between five and 6 million? Are they between nine and 10 million? Are they between 15 and 20 million? Are they between 40 and 50? Whatever it may be, you can figure out what the, again, if they're, if they're active, you can figure out what those consistent trends are week to week or every couple days to every couple days and you can use those as continual baselines that you update as they increase in power and that's a way that you can gauge their general activity so power and tech audits and tech to me is just the easiest and the simplest way to just really kind of i don't want to say dumb it down but just to keep things simple i'm now going to show you an example of how i've done it and again this is an outdated sheet uh because i'm building a current one <laughs> but uh it, it still will get the point across so if I show you this, you'll see as an example, this is something that I think we used in Infinity Kingdom back in the day, but you can see here, shout out to my buddy Babson. Uh, you can see that we track it every couple days, right? These were being ran every two days. And again, that's why I said this is an old one. It's not even one of the more recent ones from that time. But you can see here what the average increases are, right? So as an example, this player was doing what 40 oh sorry not 40 30 no what is that 24 7 yeah so they did 24 that day uh the next uh sorry 24 in between and you can see here right from 31 to 11 15 and then for the next one you can see that uh they did what is it 183 to 231 so you're looking at uh, 20 uh what is that 50 48 as an example so this one is a little bit more in line right because if you're able to do 24 just assuming if you're able to do 24 uh, donations per 24 hours then this is that means they were on for each one uh, right these are just good examples of what you're looking at now this one here or sorry where where uh, where am i going this one was what 37 so a little bit lower uh in in that case and if i'm looking here here's a good example right 289 to 289 that means this person hasn't donated anything to tech and I bet you if they haven't donated anything to tech, they probably haven't powered up that much either. But if you're going off something that says last online, that always isn't going to be foolproof because it's only gonna tell you the last time they were online. It's not necessarily gonna tell you what did they do while they were online. And that's the most important part. That's why my recommendation to you is to do something where you track tech, you track power, and you do it, I would argue, every two days in the beginning. And then once it gets later, then you can do it every three days, every four days as time goes on and you start kind of leveling out your base. But it's important to know this on who's active and who isn't because especially if there's a lot of players in the kingdom and there's still opportunities to recruit, you can use this as a way to open up member capacity for your alliance, especially if people want to get in. Then you just kind of know who the inactive people are like that. A little trick as well, when it comes to roles, and again, we're probably gonna get to this in a bit, but what I will say is there's something that you can do with this when it comes to kind of establishing which roles you wanna place certain people at. So I'm gonna try and do my best to remember this by the time I get there, but let me move on if I can uh, to the next one, which is gonna be uh, creating, gr oh, sorry, uh, no, we'll do sending alliance mails. So alliance mails to me, uh, I, I'm passionate about. I think writing good alliance mails can speak a lot to the alliance and what you're able to offer. So my recommendation is when you send alliance mails, you always want to format these as it is really important that you do so. And given that you can use HTML code, right, you can do things. And just to kind of give you an example, let's say I want to do bold. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the alliance. We'll do this, at least I'm, I'm assuming I still should be able to do this. And we'll just put a title in here, write test introduction, and I'm going to send. And I'll show you how this looks here, right? You can see that the HTML code worked. So my thing is just, again, format a mail well, right? And that means spacing it. You know, I like to do the number and the, oh, what is it, the uh, parenthesis. Uh, again, you can do different sizes for mails. I think calling out in bold or different colors to specific things can be important. Again, 
having just something that is easy to read it's not like do not send a wallet text like i will i will i will slap myself silly <laughs> right and again have some spacing do some formatting keep it a couple sentences maybe per paragraph not too much and again have it and again get to the point right and have it be something that is easily digestible doesn't mean that it can't be long but what it means is that it shouldn't be where you have 10 sentences in a paragraph and again to reiterate, you just don't want it to look like a wall of text. Uh, and then let's talk about some of the other options when it comes to sending alliance mails, like things that you can really benefit from. So here's a decree, and decree is basically a, a pen. And here, watch, we'll, we'll do this. Test my decree mail, right? And we'll do decree test. And you see I have the decree selected. Let's do send. And then when I'm going here, let's go back to inbox. And you'll see, here we go. Uh, this is a decree test. So this is something where they basically created a pinned place for Alliance Mails, which I actually love because this is a way where you can send out a long mail about specific things. Like, let's say you want to write a best practices mail. Uh, let's say you want to write a mail about events that come up often. Let's say you want to write a mail on PVP strategy and tactics or hero pairings, talent builds, what artifacts you should attach on certain heroes. And then members can have those saved in game so they can easily refer back to them. This is a great addition to the game and I absolutely love this. So, and remember, you can always delete these two as well if you want to, but I'm a really, I'm a really big fan of Alliance Decree Mails. Now let's go and show you a few of the other options that you can do in mails. So not only can you do a decree, right? But you can pin, you can send a ready check for 24 hours, and I can even attach a marker onto this as well. However, let me say that if you plan to do a ready check, the challenge here, and, I'm, and I will say this, I'm not a fan, you, you have to spend, I believe that's prestige, in order to send ready check or readiness checks. Now, if I click here, you can see on the bubble, right? It says decree. Only leaders and title officers can do this. Up to 10 decrees can be active at once. All alliance members can view issued decrees. Pin, you can pin one decree at a time. Uh, readiness check, allow members to confirm that they are ready, giving you an idea of ongoing preparations for any alliance activity and add coordinates. Add coordinates to a decree, allowing alliance members to instantly view the designated location. These... Uh, markers or coordinates are good if let's say you're planning a siege on a behemoth layer or let's say you're going to do a rally on a pass or let's say you're putting this down and marking coordinates for where you're going to attack next right and you're just doing that ahead of time before everyone gets online and ready to go to war or something these are nice because it'll take you right where you need to go uh, the important part here right is that is that with the readiness check and again that's why i said i really wish that they did that it didn't cost anything um, for whatever reason, for why it does. But these are readiness checks are great if you're trying to get an idea on how many people may show up for a fight, how many people may show up for war. Uh, you know, you can use this for you know, you know, who's available uh, online to go and do an event in a in a few hours. I will say this: the one thing I would love for them to do here is make this custom, so it's not just presets. But then there's a button here that says custom, or there's just one button that says set your time, and you can just set it to whatever you want right? To me, that's really what should happen. Uh, now let's talk about creating group chats. So group chats is really important because this is probably where the majority of your members are going to live. So an example here on how to do this would be uh, is we're going to, well, I'm trying to figure out how I want to do this the short way or the long way. So, oh, cool. I can like clear my cash. That's so cool. Let's do that. Uh, clear my cash, clear my cash. I'm a sugar. Okay. So if I do plus, let's say that I want to add people that are in my alliance. These people are not in my alliance, but what you would do is uh, if you have a, a bunch of people in your alliance, typically it'll show those people. And then what you're going to do is you're just going to go through like this. You'll select everyone. You'll click OK. And then bam, right? I instantly have a group chat. And again, I'm, I'm going to remove these people here in a moment, right? But then you can add or remove members. You can, I can retitle this. So like, let's say I wanted to, oh, here, let's say, like, let's say I wanted to say Alliance PVP tips, just as an example, right? Bam, saved. Now, 
check this out. Let's say I want to pin this so I just always have it here in case I need to refer to anything. You And, and bear in mind, I'm on the PC client, but you can do the same thing if you're on mobile. You press, drag to the right, star, and look at that. Now this and Tamara's chat are starred, meaning they're always going to be there. So if I go out and I go back in, guess what? It's still right here at the top. So these are really important things that you can do and really good ways to kind of get people or sorry, get your alliance more organized, your people in your alliance more organized. So that way you, again, can appear not only more professional, but it helps organize discussions. Probably one of the biggest things. There's so many different types of discussions that can happen in an alliance chat that that compartmentalizing specific topics can really bolster and improve the overall engagement within your alliance. And then also the level of information they get from it and how better they feel about it because they don't have to go and dig for specific topics or to go back and try to comment on something. They have a dedicated group chat that your alliance is able to do it in. Next is going to be conducting diplomacy. Now, diplomacy for me is, again, it, it, everyone's going to have their own style, but but the short version here for diplomacy is that it's important for whatever zone one region you start in that my recommendation is you reach out to other players that are in your region as leaders, right? So you want to reach out to the leaders in other alliances within your zone one, and you just want to introduce yourself, right? You might reach out to a leader and just type, hi, uh, you know, my name's BN, I'm a part of this alliance. I just wanted to reach out to see maybe what your plans were for the region. You know, do, are you guys looking to go out to any uh, behemoths in mind? Um, you know, how many players, you know, do you have a lot of active players? Uh, you know, just again, trying to introduce, say hi. Uh, you know, you tell them a little bit about you. You ask them for a little bit of information about them. And it just helps you get a little bit more a lay of the land. Right, so you can figure out, okay, well, who's maybe going to be aggressive, who's not going to be aggressive. What am I? Am I going to be able to be here, uh, build here amicably? Uh, well, you know, hopefully, we, you know, there'll be unimpeded. Uh, we can build unimpeded without being attacked, right? So it's always good, and also it's it's a good way to build, start building some rapport, right? Do some networking, build some communication, and you know, establish some level of conversation with those people. Uh, and like I said, always coming at it from an introductory approach instead of saying, oh, well, hey, I'm going to build here. Can you build over there? Please do not do that. That is one of the worst things you can do as your very first message, right? The first thing you should do is introduce yourself and then, you know, maybe you share a little bit about what your expectations are, right? Uh, and, and maybe what you're hoping to accomplish before you kind of get into business. You know, you got to warm them up, butter them up first, at least buy them dinner first. You know what I mean? Or at least an appetizer. Next one here is going to be uh, des designating R1 to R3 roles. And this is where I'm going to also circle back to the whole uh, kind of tech audit part. And I'm also going to work something else in here that revolves around Discord uh, that I think is actually a really good idea. And shout out to my buddy Ghost uh, from my IK Rock days. Uh, not the Ghost that I know here in uh, COD, just so that doesn't get misconstrued. Uh, or people don't think that it, uh, that it's him over the, my, my other buddy. So the first one here for... R1 to R3 roles is one of the things I have seen people do, and my buddy, my buddy Ghost has done this, and I actually somewhat like this idea, is where you everyone comes in as R1, but if you want to get R2 or higher, you have to join the Discord. And I'm also going to put an asterisk here, because remember, not everyone has Discord, but if you know that if you know that a lot of people have Discord in your alliance, I do think that it can be one way and one approach that you go with. It doesn't mean that you always have to, but it is something that I've seen before. In addition, when it comes to the tech audit and the power audit, if you notice that some players maybe aren't powering or leveling up as much as they should be, on, excuse me, on average, put them at rank one. Because if you do it that way, you can keep an eye on them easier. And you also know that it's something you should look out for when you're doing your power and tech audits. Something that I've done before, and I have actually found great success <laughs> in it. The other one is when it comes to R2s and R3s, it does depend. R1, I think, is really for anyone that just is joining the Alliance but hasn't really kind of been there that long. Maybe they haven't really proven themselves. Maybe they're not that active in chat. Or maybe you're waiting to see if they're going to keep powering up. I think R1 is more of a staging role, right? It's where you can kind of feel out the people that have joined and then go from there. If you notice that people are consistently powering up, don't even attack, they're active in social and chat, right? You could maybe then go ahead and raise them to rank two. 
Rank three for me really should be dedicated for, I would say, like the top active people and your fighters, right? Like just your your hard, more, I don't want to say hardcore, but just the people that are higher than average activity and higher than average participatory or participating in PvP. Um, and that could all, and that can also be for things like behemoths. That can be for uh, doing uh, acolyte leading, for going in, uh, kind of killing the acolytes that are around behemoths. Uh, that could be uh, leading certain uh, AVA or alliance events, right? I think that's really more deserving of an R three role. And again, you can do it however you want. This is just somewhat of a general guideline. Uh, then let's get to uh, kind of creating alliance processes. I think this is important, so that way players have a good understanding of what's expected in the alliance and how the alliance goes about conducting itself. An example of processes could be, well, explaining on why and how you guys do power and tech audits. Uh, for example, how you guys go about doing guardians. Explaining that information to the player base or to your alliance, uh, I guess, members or community is important to do. And it can be more than that. It can be, hey, this is how we go about communicating. Hey, if you have, if something comes up, this is who you should contact. Really breaking down and, uh, again, informing your alliance members of how certain things go uh, in that alliance is important to do before, hopefully, any of those situations arise. Uh, the next one here for me is going to be officer titles and buffs. And for this one, we're just going to have to go into a different alliance so I can show this one off. So let's go here. And if I click on members, you can see as an example, these titles are actually pretty similar to uh, to Rock, where you can see here, I don't know if I have an option. Let's see if I can go back to our alliance. But uh, again, very similar for what we saw. Let's see if... Hmm. So I can't do that. Let's try to hold that one in. Let's see. Oh, man, I wish. And I bet you someone's going to come and hit me and be like, yo, you totally missed out. There's got to be some here where it says handing out titles, and it's got to be something that they can't do. Union management, edit, disband. Uh, issue lines, behemoths. Hmm. Well, anyways, point being... I don't have anyone here now, but what you would normally do is if you see a player, or sorry, not a see a player, but if you have someone as an officer, you can promote them, or sorry, not promote them. You There will be a little circle and a plus sign or something of the sort next to their name, and you'll click on that, and you'll just assign them a title. Uh, and uh, titles can be, you know, uh, and I have to I have to remember if this is the case, but they'll basically, and just so I don't say anything incorrectly because I can't see anything right now, in short, they will give them a buff of some sort. Um, and typically you want to give people these titles while they are online and not just give people the titles and then don't worry about it anymore. It's important that you're constantly refreshing who has an officer title. So you're taking advantage of giving them those buffs while they're online to maximize and to take advantage of it. Then I think we're pretty much coming to an end. So what I'm going to do here is give you my good characteristics for leaders and kind of my conclusive ending notes. I actually thought this video was going to be a little shorter, but, you know, to each their own. <laughs> uh, so, I, again, I, I think lastly I'll say when it comes to good characteristics for leaders, I think having a cool, calm, and collected approach to everything is always going to be important. If you take things too seriously or if you get panicked or make impulsive decisions, those characteristics, that emotional state, can sometimes bleed into the alliance. If you're worried... Why would they not be worried, right? So again, remaining kind of cool, calm, collected, being able to assess situations and then come to hopefully quick, decisive decisions on what those next steps will be, very important. Being willing to take the time out of your day to go and check in with alliance members, check in with your alliance, right? Do the kind of heart-to-heart -heart stuff, that really will help you strengthen your alliance's morale and more and again your and by extension your players morale is really important to do uh, having a respect for everyone keeping things neutral uh more or less at all times right especially in public chats is very important setting you know again be, you know be the change you want to see right set that standard early by you being by you leading by example 
So that for me, I think, you know, more or less covers everything that I would say is important to do if you want to be a good leader from a foundational and and building, I should say, a good foundation in order to do so. With that in mind, that is going to do it for me. I would love to hear your guys' thoughts on this one. Let me know in the comments down below. In addition, if you have any, uh, I guess for lack of better words, additional ways to go about managing or different ways might be better about how you go about managing, whether it be completely different changes, maybe some slight changes, I and I'm sure everyone else would love to hear. So let us know in the comments down below and what you think about this video. That is going to do it for me. As always, until next time, I will catch you later.